Welcome to the lecture on money. Now, money is often taken for granted as something that we use as payment in an economy. And we've talked about why money is so important briefly in conducting monetary policy. But we haven't really talked about the four major functions of money. And this is what we're going to focus on in today's video. So before we go into the four major functions, we're going to look at the definition of money. So money is any item or thing. So some people just consider it coins or notes, but money is any any item or thing readily accepted as a means of payment. As a means of payment. So for example, if there were a very ancient tribe and they used seashells as a standard of payment then seashells would in fact be money but in today's day and age money greatly refers to notes and coins now even money now has moved towards this idea of credit cards or bank cards so money has changed over the years so to look at an example, previously uh, in in the prehistoric ages, we used these this barter notion of barter, and barter was when we we said, okay, I'll exchange you say this book in exchange for this uh, this the paper or a, a large stack of paper so that I can make more books. And that was a form of exchange. Some fishermen would exchange their their um, seafood. For, for meat, or some fishermen would exchange their seafood for clothes, and that was a form of payment so that people could facilitate their needs and wants. So, with that in mind, we're going to look at the four functions of money and how money has changed over the years. So, the first function of money is that it is a medium of exchange. And what this is, is that money is an object generally accepted in exchange for goods and services. So instead of this barter system, so it replaces barter system, which required this double coincidence of want, is actually made this exchange or this marketplace more effective so what this double coincidence of once means is that if say in your previous life you were a fisherman and you you um, fished and you used uh, seafood as your major source of exchange for other goods and services you have to find someone that actually met that that need or requirement as well so Take for example, you have caught 10 fish that day, and you only need one fish that day to have dinner. However, you also needed water for that day to survive, or you needed oil to cook the fish. So you needed to sell your remaining 9 fish for water and, and oil. But you have to find, you have to go to a merchant which, who sold water and oil, who also wanted fish. So say if that merchant who sold water didn't actually want fish, then you couldn't exchange it. But in the the current economic climate or current economic um, situations, conditions at the moment, we can see that people can sell fish in the market for people who have money, and then they could use that money to purchase water or oil. So instead of uh, going from fish directly to water or this exchange for fish to water at the moment or in this current market system they could go from fish to money and then money they could use for water and so the the person who received the money the the um, the merchant who sold water could then use their money or this money to actually exchange for something that they want so it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the merchant selling water actually 
requires fish. It means that they could use water to say buy meat. So that's the first use of money is that it doesn't require this double coincidence of wants and it, and it is readily accepted as a mean or a medium of exchange. The second use of money or the second function is this unit of account function. So this unit of account function is a common medium in which or by which prices of goods and services are expressed. So when we express prices of goods and services, we need a common account of measure. We can't say, okay, we, can, we can't really uh, effectively say that this book is worth two computer or this computer is worth two books because it, it does require subjectiveness and it does require um, judgment and it becomes very inaccurate as to how much a certain good or service is worth. But by using money, it provides a common medium and therefore establishes both absolute prices as well as relative prices. So take an example of five different goods and services. So we have good A, B, C, D, and E. In an absolute or an absolute price scale, using money as a medium of exchange, we can say that, all right, product A costs five dollars, product B costs ten dollars, product C costs seven dollars, product D say costs six dollars, and finally product E costs fifteen dollars, say for example. And we only have five different prices to measure A, B, C, and D. And then we can also use these prices to measure relative prices. So say A to E is 1 to 3. So, so we have one value of A, so one value of E is worth three values of A. So we can use that as a mean of absolute prices. So relative prices as well. But if we didn't have money as a common unit of account, we have to express this these um, five goods and services as a quote of each other. So we have A to B, A to C, A to D, A to E. So A is worth how many Bs, A is worth how many Cs, A, A is worth how many Ds, and so on. And as we can see, that there are many, many different possible relative prices that we have to account for. And if we increase the the number of goods to say from five to say a hundred thousand, which which is currently available in the economy, then this would have very very large consequences on the number of relative prices needed to be stated. But in this case, by using absolute or money prices provides a common unit of account in which prices of goods and services are expressed. And a very subsequent um, subcategory of this unit of account measure is this standard of the third payment function money service. So if somebody wants to take out loans or to borrow money or to borrow something how is it that the the lender would get their payment back? So if say I wanted to borrow money to buy a house, if we didn't have money, then it would just effectively be I wanted to borrow that house until I could gather enough goods and services in order to repay you for that house. But that again requires this double coincidence of wants, and it doesn't really show how much debt is owed to that particular person.
So what money does is that it allows a common unit by which loans and repayments and debt can be expressed. So if we wanted to buy a house for a hundred for a say a million dollars, then we can see that we have to pay off around a million dollars. It's not say I need to pay off you in five cars, I need to pay you five cars, say um, twenty sofas, five hundred books, and so on. It becomes very, very complicated if money isn't pre present and that we have to use goods and services as a standard of deferred payment. So because money is a unit of account and it measures the price of goods and services, it allows people to borrow and loan money. And lastly, money can also be expressed. I'm just going to write this out. Money can also be expressed as a store of value. Yeah, so money is one of many forms of assets. So we, we noted that money is also an asset. And money doesn't lose value too much apart from uh, inflation, inflation as does many other assets. So it is the most liquid of all assets meaning that it can be readily exchanged for goods and services and it is convenient, safe and the price doesn't fall like some other assets such as shares. So it doesn't risk the value of money to fall dramatically if there is an occurrence of inflation, especially if you put it in a bank and receive interest on that money. So we're going to look at the example why money as a store of value is so important. Okay, we're going to come back to this fisherman example or fisherman analogy again. We know that people want fresh fish, right? And say a fisherman caught 20 fish that day. And we know that after one day, the fish, after you've, you've, um, you've caught them from the ocean, and after you've harvested them, they're not going to be fresh. So they, you need to sell them straight away. But if we didn't have money, and the fisherman wanted to buy, say, a car, this is a very, um, a very sophisticated barter system, and these people can actually manufacture cars for some reason. Um, the fisherman wants to buy a car, but it doesn't. He doesn't have enough money to buy a car. It doesn't have enough fish in order to exchange for this car manufacturer. But the car manufacturer has no incentive to buy that many fish because he can't eat all that that many fish on one night. So there would be a double coincidence, or there would be a lack of double coincidence of ones because the car manufacturer doesn't want that many fish and one fish isn't worth one car so what happens is the fisherman cannot purchase the car and therefore his goods his, his living standards specifically material will not be maximized so what money does in this case is that the fisherman can sell his 20 fish to many different people and instead of receiving goods and services in return he's going to receive money and he's going to catch another 20 fish the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day. And assuming that he sells fish for $20 per fish, and the car costs $10,000, he's eventually going to make up the money to buy the car. And again, if he doesn't make up the money, he could possibly borrow money from the bank, since money is also a standard of deferred payment. So... The fisherman could borrow, say, $10,000 from the bank and buy the car now and then slowly pay off the bank by selling fish. So that's a very important function of money, is that money has a store of value. It doesn't uh, depreciate like fish does after they go bad. It keeps its value and therefore it allows people to save up money to buy larger purchases. So they're the four functions of money. Firstly, it is a medium of exchange. This is the one we're very familiar with. Secondly, it is a unit of account. It allows us to express goods and services as a common price. And it also, by extension, allows us to 
to determine relative prices between goods and services. And this is very important in resource allocation. Thirdly, is this a standard of deferred payment so people could use use money to provide for loans, debt, uh, and express repayment. And lastly, money is a very important store of value. So it is a it is one of many assets which in which we can hold wealth.